This video idea was suggested by Cheeky Charles, Captain Fez, Riley Bankovic, Super Snuggle Fluff, and Sparkle CC. If you have any suggestions for future videos, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. The Tower of Terror story begins back in 1989 at Disney's MGM Studios, better known today as Disney's Hollywood Studios. The park was brand new, just a few attractions and only one ride, but lots of potential. Not too long after it had opened, Disney began to toy with the idea of adding a few more attractions and even an eventual expansion. Over the course of the next few months, some new attractions did pop up in the park, giving it a better sense of variety as well as adding some more in-park options for its guests. Now that those attractions were completed, Disney was looking into how they could expand MGM Studios, and eventually they settled on making a new land. Much like the other sections of the park that were based off real locations in California, the newest addition would be a recreation of Sunset Boulevard. The themed land would open with a bunch of different shops and restaurants, and at the end, a brand new attraction. The only issue was, Imagineers weren't exactly sure what that attraction would be. Luckily enough, Disney's newest CEO, Michael Eisner, already had a pretty good idea. He knew that he wanted a horror attraction somewhere within the park. This was really part of a more grand scheme of his to get older crowds interested in the parks again. It's also why attractions like Star Tours and the Indiana Jones stunt show were created in the first place. Plus, if there ever was a Disney park to put a horror attraction in, MGM Studios was the one. Not only was it already meant to appeal to an older audience, but it also celebrated classic movies, and there were more than a few in the horror genre that they could choose from. Once it was decided that the new attraction would indeed be a ride and not a show, ideas began to be pitched out as to what movie the ride should be based on. There were a number of different IPs that were all considered, most of which were shot down almost immediately, but there was a ride that did get pretty far in the development stage, that ride being Hotel Mel, a horror-based dark ride narrated by Mel Brooks. Now, you might be asking yourself, why Mel Brooks? And maybe some of you movie laymen out there might be asking yourselves, who is Mel Brooks? Well, Brooks directed quite a few successful comedies throughout the late 60s and 70s. One of his most popular films was the 1974 classic Young Frankenstein. Originally, a ride based on this film was one of the first concepts pitched out for the new expansion area, and was what Imagineers thought they would end up making. But not too long after Brooks officially signed on to help them develop it, they realized it wouldn't have worked due to spacing limitations. This is what kind of led them to realizing that the Sunset Boulevard expansion would instead be a better choice. So now instead of basing the ride off Young Frankenstein, it would now be a completely different attraction but one that was still hosted by Mel Brooks, since he was already working with the Imagineers. The dark ride concept would have taken riders through an abandoned hotel. In its early stages, it was described as a more comedic version of the Haunted Mansion, but not too long after they began to develop it, Imagineers hit a bump. In short, they just couldn't figure out a way to make the attraction story work. They weren't sure if the ride should put riders into a specific movie like they would have been on Star Tours, or if it should give them kind of a behind-the-scenes look at the movie-making process, like on the Backlot Tour. Because of this, the dark ride concept was ultimately thrown out. The only element that was really retained was the abandoned hotel aspect. Imagineers figured that facade would have worked well in the park no matter what the attraction inside of it was. A few more ideas were tossed around, and eventually they landed on the idea for an elevator-themed drop ride. This idea mainly stuck because it allowed them to keep the old hotel facade while simultaneously bringing a new type of thrill attraction to the Disney parks. Now, drop rides in and of themselves were not a new concept. The first one had opened up eight years prior at Six Flags Magic Mountain, and since then, clones of the same ride had popped up at other theme parks around the country. Originally, Disney planned to model their drop ride after the original, only changing the theming surrounding the attraction and not further developing the ride system, but once again due to spacing limitations, the Imagineers decided to develop a completely new ride system. In the process, Disney created the AGVs, short for Autonomous Guided Vehicles, which could now move without the need of a track, instead only having to follow a magnetic strip embedded in the ground. Once the new ride system was finally finished, construction was ready to begin on the tower, but Imagineers still felt that the attraction needed a movie tie-in. After all, just about every other attraction in MGM Studios at the time had one. Not too long after that, Disney acquired the rights to NBC's The Twilight Zone. If you're unfamiliar with the series, let me be the first to tell you that it's great. Hosted by Rod Serling, the show was equal parts horror, mystery, and fantasy, all with a general eeriness that made it very interesting. The show itself only ran from 1959 to 1964, but its status as an iconic piece of American television had only grown in the last 25 years, making it the perfect fit for a theme park dedicated to celebrating classic movies. Imagineers now focused on creating a storyline for the attraction and put some of the finishing touches on a few of its smaller theming details. The Twilight Zone Tower of Terror began its construction in 1992 and wrapped up about two years later in July of 1994. Later that month, the all-new Sunset Boulevard opened, and with it, the Tower of Terror. At a final cost of about $150 million, the tower was Disney's most expensive attraction to date, 
only rivaled today by Radiator Springs Racers and Test Track. Almost immediately the new attraction was a hit. Its story, atmosphere, and thrill element all combined to make what was, at the time, considered to be the very best that Imagineers could offer. Even though it's reaching 25 years of operation, it's still considered to be one of the best attractions that Disney has ever created. However, that's not to say the tower hasn't seen any changes. While it's remained untouched in terms of its theming, the ride system has had a few different variations. When it first opened, the tower only dropped once, top to bottom one big drop. The next change came two years after that, in May of 1996, when the elevator was modified and now dropped twice per ride. In March of 1999, they added a few new features, like more rumbling, faster acceleration, and a heightened sense of weightlessness when falling, but the actual drop still only happened twice. The last change came in early 2003, when the randomized drop sequence was added. Now riders could get anywhere from 5 to 8 different drops in the tower per ride. This is also the same ride system still in operation today. Now, while the Florida Tower story might end there for now, the next part of our story takes us back over to Anaheim. Towards the end of the 90s, Imagineers were wrapping up on their newest project, a brand new park across the street from Disneyland by the name of Disney's California Adventure. Needless to say, people in California were very excited for a new Disney park. There have been rumors of one coming to that property for years now, with a few different planned projects that all ultimately ended up canceled. Disney was well aware that the new park would be amassing tons of visitors. Not only that, but it also had the possibility of being so popular that it would steal guests from Disneyland. To combat this, Disney began to develop a new ride for Frontierland at the original park that would open a year or two after the DCA did to thin out the massive crowds that the DCA was expecting to have. Using the tower's technology, they would bring back a scrapped concept called Geyser Mountain. In essence, it would be just like the tower, but with all new theming. Instead of taking guests from the basement of an abandoned hotel up to the top via an elevator, it would instead take them from the bottom of a mine up to the peak of a mountain. Try to imagine the theming of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad coupled with the Tower of Terror's ride system. That was basically the idea. However, when Disney's California Adventure did open in 2001, it was not what Disney executives were expecting whatsoever. In short, the park was horrific, and so were its attendance numbers. In its first year, the park only saw 5 million visitors, less than half of what Disneyland saw that same year. Even worse, of those who actually did visit the park, more than 80% reported that they were unsatisfied with their visit. It became very apparent that it wasn't Disneyland that needed the help a new attraction would bring, that the California Adventure did instead. With Disney being short on not only time, but also money, they opted not to develop a new attraction for the park, and instead just bring over the already very popular Tower of Terror. And that's what they did. Some small changes were made in terms of the ride system out of necessity, but we'll get to that in a minute. The California Tower of Terror started construction around 2001, and wrapped up in 2003. The attraction officially opened on May 5th of 2004. Alright, now that we got both towers open and operating, let's take a look at some of the differences between the two. The first and most noticeable change between them is in the architecture. The Florida version pulls most of its design elements from the same neo-mediterranean style that was very popular in the early 1920s, around the same time that the hotel would have been built within the attraction storyline. Another key reason the original tower needed to be designed like this was due to MGM Studios' proximity to Epcot. You see, when you're standing at Epcot's Mexico Pavilion, if you look across the Seven Seas Lagoon at Morocco, you can actually see the backside of the Tower of Terror. However, most guests would never even notice this, due to the fact that the two architectural styles blend together so well. The DCA Tower would also be somewhat different in that it wasn't designed after an old Hollywood-style hotel, but instead a more Los Angeles-style hotel. The design used on the DCA version was Pueblo Deco, a style a lot more buildings were made in towards the end of the 1920s. Both designs on both towers were ultimately made to help them fit in better with their respective parks. The queues are somewhat different as well. The Florida version has you go up through a winding, overgrown walkway up to the entrance of the hotel before entering the lobby. On more crowded days, the extended queue sees some use, but normally the lobby is where the line begins. The lobby for both towers is near identical, and so is the rest of the hotel's interior. The only exception would be in the boiler room. While it is visually the same, the Florida version is only one story, whereas its California counterpart has two. The main reason for this change was because of the new ride system, so let's talk about the differences there. In the Florida version, you strap in and the doors close. You then go up, move around in the fifth dimension scene, and into the drop shaft. After that, you drop a few times and unload. In the California version, you strap in, the doors close, and the elevator moves backwards into the drop shaft. It then goes up, drops a few times, and you unload. The unloading process between the two is different as well. In the Florida version, the boarding and exiting happen in two different locations, while in California, you enter and exit in the same place. Another difference is that instead of the fifth dimension scene, the DCA tower has the wave goodbye scene, where riders can see themselves in a mirror before they go further up the tower. Lastly, the DCA version doesn't have the same randomized drop sequence that the studio's version has, so every single ride through is exactly the same. All these changes happen either due to spacing limitations or capacity, but the general story and atmosphere of the attraction remain untouched during its transfer from the East Coast over to the West Coast. After it opened, the DCA Tower of Terror amassed its own following of Disney fans, much like the original Tower of Terror did. The new attraction quickly became a staple of the park. In the following years, the ride operated with no major changes whatsoever, but let's fast forward to 2014, because Marvel is about to release a movie that'll have an impact on not only the film industry, but also the Disney theme parks as well. 
Marvel released Guardians of the Galaxy on August 1st of 2014. The film was an instant hit with audiences and grossed over $700 million worldwide, making it the highest grossing superhero film of 2014 and one of the biggest movies for that whole year. It was no surprise that almost immediately a sequel was announced, but one thing that did come as a surprise was that a ride based on the franchise would be coming to Disney's California Adventure. Even more surprising is that it would be replacing that park's Tower of Terror. Disney officially announced Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout on August 23rd of 2016, and gave us an idea of what to expect in terms of the ride mechanics as well as the new story. This all leads to the same kind of like insanely fun rocketing up and down ride experience that we have today. But the framing and the setting and the pacing and the timing all completely altered to feed this really very funny, very exciting, very irreverent story. Almost immediately following the announcement, severe backlash began to hit from Tower of Terror fans, taking to almost every form of social media to voice their disapproval, some even going so far as to start petitions or boycott the park. Needless to say, this decision made a lot of people unhappy. The tower's final day of operation was on January 2nd of 2017 and was closed the next day. Two weeks later, the Hollywood Tower Hotel sign was taken down and relocated. After that, the building began to be rethemed. Over the course of the next four months, the exterior facade began to change from the Hollywood Tower into the Collector's Fortress. While the exterior was on full display throughout the reconstruction, the interior was still pretty much a mystery, as the most information we had seen were just a few pieces of concept art. On April 25th, however, some media groups got an exclusive look inside the nearly completed attraction. A few cue photos emerged, as well as some more info on the music that the attraction would use. Songs like Free Ride, Give Up the Funk, Born to be Wild, and Burning Love would all be utilized in the ride's new randomized drop sequence. Music plays a big role in Guardians of the Galaxy, as it does here. So as the chaos unfolds, as we zoom up and down, we're doing this to the tune of, of course, great rock and roll. But other than that information, the general public still knew very little about the actual attraction. In the days leading up to its grand opening, more media and press groups got early access to the ride, this time being able to take photos and videos, giving us their first actual look at the queue and ride. And now that we have that information, we can finally look at what all was changed. First off, the most noteworthy change would be the tower's facade, which has almost completely been redone. It still retains its original form, but just looks very different. The next change is in the new queue, and we'll start with what used to be the hotel's lobby. Just about every piece of furniture and decor the lobby had has since been removed to open up the room completely and give it more space for the new queue. The old furniture has all been replaced with the collector's display cases. Towards the back of the room, the fireplace and the Hollywood Tower Hotel logo have both been removed. In their place is now a screen that plays one of the Q videos, which gives a little backstory as to who the collector is, what this building is for, and why you're here. Plus, it even has all the original actors reprising their roles, like Chris Pratt, Zoe Saldana, Batista, and Benicio Del Toro. It's even got a Stan Lee cameo. Once you've made it through all that, you're ushered into what was previously the library, now retrofitted to be the collector's office. Much like the lobby, all the bookshelves and theming elements that were in here have all been replaced. The library used to serve as the pre-show room, giving the backstory of the Hollywood Tower Hotel and giving us some context as to why it's abandoned. The new office holds a similar purpose as it too plays the pre-show. From the library, you head into what used to be the boiler room. Not too much has actually changed in here besides the lighting and some small visual changes to give it a more sci-fi kind of feel. From there you load into the elevator, or as it's called now, the gantry lift, and begin your ride. The biggest change that the ride system saw was the integration of the randomized drop sequence. Not only is the drop portion randomized, but the ride storyline can change as well. Once you're strapped in and the doors close, you still move backwards like you would in the Tower of Terror, but instead of a Rod Serling narration in pitch black darkness, you instead see an outline of rocket above your lift. Next we're taken up to blow the generator. From there we rise and fall, seeing different screens of the Guardians fighting their way out of the fortress. All scenes are randomized and can vary from ride to ride. From what I can tell, the wave goodbye scene as well as the hallway scene were both made into spaces for the new screens to go. Now, I'm not 100% sure about that one though. I do have a sneaking suspicion that the generator scene is actually a real set. If it is, it's likely what was previously the hallway scene. If I'm wrong, I'll be sure to make a note of it either in the description or in a pinned comment, so keep an eye out. Besides all those changes, the ride is the same as it used to be. There are a few smaller changes like the gift shop, which has since been loaded with Guardians of the Galaxy merchandise and completely rethemed, but besides all that, the attraction is the same. The loss of DCA's Tower of Terror is definitely a big one, not only for fans of the attraction, but also for those who respect what that attraction did for the once struggling Disney park. There's definitely a case to be made that it was the tower that started to turn that park around and finally bring some guests over to it, and to see Disney have no real regard or respect for that fact did not sit right with some people. 
Ultimately, I do understand why they think a more family-friendly ride would be more appealing to the average guest, but regardless of what Mission Breakout has to offer, I don't think it'll be able to bring what the Tower of Terror brought in terms of thrill, suspense, and atmosphere. And while some may argue that the DCA Tower is a less interesting clone of the original, I still maintain that it was one of the best attractions that the Disney California Adventure has ever seen. And as long as my heart will beat, lover will always meet here in my deep dream. All right, and finally, right about there, that's a palm tree. Ha, ha, ha.